And uh, because of, the, if, unfortunately, Dr. Kinam Kim is not able to join us for live question and answer, we go to the next uh, speaker. So the next uh, talk is uh, from Michael Abrash, uh, who is the chief scientist of Meta Reality Labs, um, which is a, re a research laboratory that brings together a world-class R&D team of scientists, developers, and engineers to build the future of connection within the virtual and augmented reality. Michael was a graphic lead for the first two versions of uh, Windows NT, team with uh, John Carmack on Quake, and the work on the first uh, two versions of Microsoft Xbox, and helped develop a virtual reality at Valve. He is also the author of several books, including Michael Abrash Programming Black Book. So his presentation is entitled Creating the Future, Augmented Reality, the Next Human-Machine Interface. Please enjoy his presentation. Good morning. I'm always delighted to share my vision of the future of human-oriented computing, but I am particularly happy to be speaking with you today because in the last couple of months, augmented reality, virtual reality, and the metaverse, which I'll collectively call XR from now on, have become the hot topic of discussion across the tech world. And that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about today. Before we get started, it would be useful to define a few terms. Virtual reality, or VR, involves wearing a headset that blocks photons from the real world. So everything you see comes from the display. Augmented reality, or AR, involves wearing glasses that let you see the real world normally, but can mix virtual images with the real world. Mixed reality involves combining virtual and real world images. This is the default for AR glasses, but it can also occur in VR by way of pass-through video or reconstructed models of the real world. The metaverse is an umbrella term for the shared immersive worlds just starting to emerge today that will be most compelling in AR and VR, although they will also be accessible through our current devices. No one yet knows exactly what the metaverse is or will be, but whatever it turns out to be, it will be built on AR and VR technology. Three months ago, no one but science fiction fans and futurists had ever heard of the metaverse. That changed overnight when Mark Zuckerberg announced at Facebook Connect that Facebook was changing its name to Meta and said, over time, I hope our company will be seen as a metaverse company. That's very exciting, especially for someone like me who has been working on XR for years. But today, the metaverse is at a very early stage, and both its technology and its applications will be evolving for decades. Making it a reality will require pushing the state of the art forward in many fields, notably including semiconductor technology, where there will be tremendous long-term opportunities. Before I get to that, though, I'd like to discuss why I believe that Mark's vision is the right one for the next 50 years. And a good place to start is by looking at the last 50 years. 50 years ago, this was the complete set of remote communication channels, a landline, with long distance more than a dollar a minute in today's dollars, and international calling about $100 for the first three minutes in today's dollars. Television, with two to four network stations, plus a few independents if you lived in a really big city. Radio, with FM just becoming widespread. US mail, newspapers, and magazines. That was it, as I remember well from when I was growing up. When you walked out the door, you could listen to a transistor radio or a car radio, but no one could get in touch with you. When you were on a plane, you might as well have been on another planet. Today, we work, play, communicate. We live in a connected world of personal computing, and that has created opportunity and empowerment on a scale that we take for granted today, but that would have been unimaginable 50 years ago. If any of us were suddenly to be transported back to 1971, my guess is that we'd feel like we were blinded, deafened, and muted. Personal computing is so deeply woven into our lives that we can't even imagine living like that today. And in fact, it would be close to impossible, short of becoming a hermit. As just one example, most of you are watching this on your laptop right now. 
Multiply that by hundreds of ways personal computing has embedded itself in our lives, and it's clear that it has remade the world over the course of my lifetime. I call this the first great wave of human-oriented computing, and it has been the greatest change in how we live in nearly a century. XR will be the second great wave, and will similarly remake the world. To understand why, let's quickly look at how the first great wave happened. That wave started in the 70s at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, where a team of researchers took on the mission to create the office of the future and invented the laser printer, developed Ethernet, refined the mouse and developed the bitmapped windowing interface, wrote the first WYSIWYG word processor, even coined the term object-oriented, and then put all that together to build the first personal computer, the Alto. Steve Jobs negotiated two visits to see the super secret Alto in 1979. Here's what he said about that years later. And within 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this someday. It was obvious. You could argue about how many years it would take. You could argue about who the winners and losers might be. You couldn't argue about the inevitability. It was so obvious. The Macintosh and Windows spread the technology Park had created. Developers built applications on that foundation. Moore's Law enabled computers to get much smaller and faster. And today, we're able to dip into a vast ocean of digital information and connections whenever and wherever we want through two-dimensional surfaces that surround us and accompany us everywhere we go. Each of us has instant access to better communication and many orders of magnitude more information than anyone in human history. The first wave of human-oriented computing has changed our lives for the better in innumerable ways. And yet, we're only halfway to the full potential of the digital world to enhance the human experience. That's because, astonishingly successful as it has been, the Park model has one great limitation. It only allows us to interact with the digital world through 2D screens, so the digital world becomes a sort of special case within the real world. As a result, it engages only a relatively small subset of our sensory and motor systems, limiting both the amount of information that can be transmitted and the degree to which it can generate compellingly convincing experiences. The second great wave, XR, is going to change all that by starting to drive our senses in the ways they've evolved to be driven, at something approaching full bandwidth, and by amplifying our ability to act, thereby creating deeply immersive and convincing experiences. VR can already create genuine experiences, as demonstrated by the Quest 2 headset, and in the future, it will be possible to create experiences that are as valuable and convincing as the real world, or even more so. That sounds like hyperbole, so let's take a moment to see why it's actually just a statement of fact. The key is that, much as you might think otherwise, we, our conscious minds, never actually experience the real world. Instead, we interact with signals from sensors in our eyes, in our ears, in our skin, on our tongue, in our nose, in our balance organs, and throughout our body. We only know what those sensors detect, interpret, and signal to the brain, and that's actually a very small subset of the real world. The reality we consciously experience is constructed in our minds. Information comes to our senses, and we have the experiences our brain infers from that information, applying heuristics evolved over millions of years and learned over the course of a lifetime. We basically hallucinate our environment in a way that is almost always correct for the world we live in. Don't believe it? If you're experiencing the real world directly, why can't you see your blind spot? Why aren't you aware that you can't see blue straight ahead? Why can't you tell that you're only seeing an area the size of your thumb in high resolution? It's because your brain has a model that fills in those gaps with its best guess at the state of the world at every moment. And it's that model that you actually see, hear, feel, smell, and taste. At the core of the reality that each and every one of us experiences lies the fact that we're inference machines, not objective observers, by which I mean that there is, presumably, a real world out there, and your brain is taking the very limited signals coming from your sensors and trying to infer what the state of that real world is based on its internal model. Now, it's one thing to listen to words about how we infer reality, but it's another matter to actually experience it. So let's look at a case where that inference mechanism becomes visible because we break its assumptions. Something is not right here, but what? 
I'll explain this later, but the key point is that what you see in this video is ambiguous. With multiple valid solutions and your perceptual system has chosen the wrong solution based on a set of assumptions that's almost always correct. The same process happens every waking moment of your life. The only difference is that you normally infer the correct solution to the state of the world. The fact that reality is whatever your mind infers from the nerve impulses sent by your sensors based on its model of the world is at the heart of what makes XR different and more powerful than anything that's come before. It's so important that I'm going to spend a few minutes giving you a deeper sense of how ambiguous the world really is as observed through our various sensors and the extent to which reality is constructed by our minds rather than recorded by our senses. Take a good look at the blue tiles on top of the left cube. Okay, now take a good look at the yellow tiles on top of the right cube. The real colors seem obvious, but let's mask off everything but those particular tiles. They're all exactly the same shade of gray. Your visual system isn't interested in whether the photons coming from a tile in a random image are blue or yellow or gray. Knowing that didn't keep anyone from being eaten by lions on the savanna. It is interested in identifying potentially relevant features in the real world under a variety of conditions. When you look at an object, what your eye gets to work with is an approximation of the spatial distribution of wavelengths of light, but what your brain cares about is the actual color of the object. So your visual system constantly corrects for the lighting in the scene. Given the apparent lighting in this scene, the best guess is that the left tiles are blue and the right tiles are yellow. Let's look at how we perceive form next. Here we have a nice square checkerboard. Let's add some dots and see what happens. This happens because the dots cause some line detectors to fire that are normally associated with slanted edges. The checkerboard is a 2D demonstration. Next, let's straddle 2D and 3D. Take a moment and figure out which of the two ta tabletops is wider, as measured in 2D, and which is longer, assuming you rotated them to line up. Ready? They're exactly the same size. We live in a 3D world and the 3D objects implied by the 2D shapes of the tables are quite different from each other. Your brain does this calculation automatically for you, making the assumption that you're looking at a 3D world. That's wrong in the specific case of trying to compare 2D table sizes here, but in general, it allows you to function in a 3D world, which is where we happen to live. Now let's go back to the first illusion we saw. Of course, the head isn't really moving that way. What's happening here is that you're making a very reasonable assumption about the world that happens to be wrong. Here's what's actually happening. Real objects, especially faces, tend to be convex. So your visual system assumes convexity in the absence of cues to the contrary. The only way to make that assumption work in this case is for the head to be moving in very odd ways. So that's exactly what you see. Now that you know what's happening, try to see the dragon as it really is. Some people can see through the illusion, but for me at least, it always snaps back to a concave face. A little bit of conscious knowledge isn't going to undo millions of years of evolution and a lifetime of looking at faces. Our model of the world is constructed out of many inputs across all our senses, so multi-sense illusions are even more revealing about the inferential nature of reality. Next. Let's look at the McGurk effect, one of the best demonstrations I've seen of how we construct reality. I will note that the McGurk effect doesn't always work for non-native English speakers. Bar, 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 bar. Obviously, she's saying bar, bar, bar. Now, let's watch a slightly different video. Bar, 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 bar. Far, far. Here we can clearly hear her saying far, 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 but she isn't. The video shows her saying far, but it's still the same audio track of her saying bar, exactly as she did in the first video. And yet, we clearly heard her saying far. The visual input is overriding the audio. To make it crystal clear what's going on, let's look at this one more time. It'll still be the same audio of her saying bar, but this time, we'll have a split screen with a face saying far on one side 
and a facing bar on the other. As this plays, move your eyes from one side to the other and observe how what you hear changes. Again, move your eyes back and forth and see what you hear. Bar, 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 bar. The McGurk effect is an emphatic answer to the question, what is real? What you hear depends on what you're looking at, not just on the sounds hitting your eardrums. You aren't a microphone, you're an inference machine that integrates all available evidence to construct the most likely model of the world. What all this shows is that reality is what our brain reconstructs it to be based on its model of the world and the sparse data coming from our senses. I think it's fair to say that our experience of the world is an illusion, that evolution is honed to be highly functional in terms of survival and reproduction. So experiences are whatever our brains tell us they are, regardless of whether the information used to create those experiences comes from the real or the digital world. If that information is useful, whatever the source, then the experience is valuable. And, in fact, many of the most important experiences in our lives already are digitally mediated. Which brings us back to XR and why it's different from anything that's come before. XR is about experiencing a virtual world as real. And what we've just learned is that an experience is real to the extent it convinces your perceptual system and brain, because experiences are nothing more or less than whatever your mind infers from the data it receives. And as we've seen, given a particular set of inputs, we have very little conscious choice about the reality we'll experience. What that means is that XR done right truly is a real experience as far as the observer is concerned. So what does it take to do XR right? As it turns out, we don't have to exactly replicate the real world. We just have to provide the right inputs in order to satisfy the relevant sensors and drive the correct inference. The potential for this is limitless in the long run, and it's easy to come up with compelling applications that will likely start to become feasible in the relatively near future. Imagine a VR headset that's a sleek, stylish, lightweight visor with a 200 degree field of view, retinal resolution, high dynamic range, and proper depth of focus with virtual audio that's indistinguishable from real, that lets you mix real and virtual freely, that lets you meet, share, and collaborate with people regardless of distance, and that lets you use your hands to dexterously interact with the virtual world. If that existed, we'd be working, playing, and connecting in it every day. Imagine AR glasses that are socially acceptable and all-day wearable, that give you useful virtual objects like your phone, your TV, and virtual workspaces, that give you perceptual superpowers, a context-aware personal assistant, and above all, the ability to connect, share, and collaborate with others anywhere, anytime. If those glasses existed today, we'd all be wearing them right now. Let's look at one example of potentially game-changing XR and what it would take to make it happen. For five years now, I've been wishing for a virtual workspace that I could configure any way I wanted with monitor quality virtual screens, holograms, whiteboards, and whatever, saving and switching between configurations with a click. Throw in the ability to interact with my real surroundings and use a keyboard and mouse, and that would be a great work environment. And then, if I could share mixed virtual and real spaces with other people, it would become an amazingly productive collaborative environment as well. And while I'm at it, it would be great to have the ability to manipulate both real and virtual objects with my hands, complete with haptic feedback. As just one example of the potential of this workspace, imagine having virtual whiteboards. Unlike a real whiteboard, these could be as big as you want and could be resized on the fly. You could have as many as you want. They could contain images, videos, even holograms, and they could be archivable and searchable. They wouldn't just be as good as real whiteboards, they'd be a new and better tool, just as word processors were far more than just digital typewriters. I would use that collaborative virtual workspace in a heartbeat, and I believe that it would spread like wildfire, the way personal computers did back in the day. What would it take to make that collaborative workspace a reality? Well, without question, we'd need enough resolution and good enough image quality so that virtual monitors were at parity with real monitors. That would require very high-res displays and much improved optics. 
I personally think that visual acuity needs to be 20, 20 or better, but that's just the start. We'd also need the ability to render at that high resolution within tight thermal and power constraints, which would require a new graphics pipeline and very likely great eye tracking as well. Next, we would need excellent real-time mixed reality so that virtual and real objects could coexist seamlessly. We would also want to have persistent shareable virtual objects in the world so that we could, for example, set up a customized team workroom or work on tech art or some code with a teammate. To do all that, we would need private 3D maps of our local physical surroundings. And we'd want to have an intuitive, nearly frictionless command interface which would require a combination of ultra-low friction input technology and personalized, contextualized AI. When necessary, we'd also want to be able to use our hands as intuitive, highly dexterous manipulators in the virtual world. So we'd want both hand tracking and haptic gloves. And if we're going to be doing work with our hands, we'd want clear and comfortable vision within arm's length for hours of use per day, which requires variable depth of focus. We'd also want proper spatialization and propagation of virtual audio, so virtual objects and spaces would sound as real as they look. For collaborative work, we'd obviously want compelling avatars, which would require accurate real-time face, hand, eye, and body motion, as well as highly realistic appearance. Less obviously, we'd need a wider field of view so that everyone in a meeting could see everyone else. That's essential for social interaction as are voices that sound like they're coming from the right people in the right places. We'd want to be able to share our real environments with each other, both for social purposes and because physical objects will often be important to the discussion. And we'd want to wrap all this up with great ergonomics to make it comfortable to be in VR for hours at a time and to wear, wear AR glasses all day. And that would require making everything I've discussed compact and power efficient. While it may sound like science fiction, all that and more is doable. We really will be wearing those AR glasses and working, playing, and connecting in VR before too long. I believe we can apply Steve Jobs' quote here. You couldn't argue about the inevitability. It was so obvious. There's just one minor obstacle. The technology that would allow most of that to happen doesn't yet exist. But it will. XR is clearly the next great wave, and it is within reach. That said, it will be tremendously challenging to take XR to the level where it becomes part of daily life for billions of people, far more so than the wave started by Xerox PARC. For one thing, the first wave was largely a function of software piggybacking on Moore's Law. Alas, there's no underlying Moore's Law-like trend helping XR. For one thing, Moore's law itself is petering out, but more importantly, the underlying platform needs to be discontinuously better in multiple ways in order to be good enough to become a ubiquitous part of daily life. And most of those leaps are not just a function of compute and software or of any other exponential that's just going to happen on its own. Especially for AR glasses, the extraordinarily tight power, thermal, and form factor requirements can only be achieved by co-designed end-to-end hardware software stacks. End-to-end -end stacks that advance the state of the art in all these technologies will need to be developed in order to make the XR future a reality. And every one of those stacks will need custom silicon. And in the case of AR glasses, novel semiconductor technology is the only viable way to achieve the necessary level of performance. In order to give you a sense of the challenges involved with XR, I'm going to look at some of the work we're doing in several of these areas next. I want to emphasize that all this technology is still very much research and won't be in product for years, if ever, but it has the potential to take XR to the next level. Optics and displays is an obvious place to start since virtual imaging is at the heart of XR. In VR, we need to be able to put the correct photons for any given frame in the right location on the retina and unfortunately, there's no Moore's law for photons. Getting to visual experiences that are nearly indistinguishable from reality requires simultaneous advances in resolution, field of view, depth of focus, intensity, contrast, color gamut, and rendering. Making that happen requires new optics, light generation, and material science technology. Rendering certainly involves plenty of compute, but even there, the solution needs to involve custom silicon rather than just riding the commodity wave. 
The challenge is even greater for AR glasses because see-through image quality, social acceptability, and severe constraints on weight, power, and thermals are added to the mix. Let's take an in-depth look at what it's taken to solve just one of the visual challenges of XR, depth of focus. To date, all shipping VR headsets have featured fixed optics that provide just one depth of focus, typically around one and a half to two meters. This reduces sharpness and can cause fatigue and blurry vision for extended viewing within arm's length. To address this, we built a prototype we called Half Dome a few years ago. Half Dome implements a technology called Varifocal that involves moving the lenses relative to the display in order to adjust focus, based on the depth the eyes are converged at. Making this work required optics, eye tracking, actuator development, algorithm development, perception science, control software, mechanical and electrical engineering, and hooking into the Oculus SDK. Here you can see the difference Varifocal makes. However, Half Dome was too bulky for productization, so we continued to refine Varifocal, eventually developing completely new electronic Varifocal technology for Half Dome 3. Half Dome 3 replaces all moving parts with a thin stack of liquid crystal lenses. Let's take a look at a prototype module to understand how electronic Varifocal works. The next few images will be recorded through the electronic Varifocal module you see here. This is a real camera shot. Each liquid crystal lens can be turned on and off to alternate between two focal states. Here we indicate that a lens is on by highlighting it in orange. When the lens is turned off, the focus shifts to the far object. And then when the lens turns back on, it shifts to the near object again. As you can see, a single liquid crystal lens makes a great pair of digital bifocals, shifting focus between two depths. To achieve smooth varifocal, we address the full stack of liquid crystal lenses, with each additional pair doubling the number of focal planes. In this example, six liquid crystal lenses are driven to sweep through 64 focal planes, and you can see the focal depth smoothly changing at the right as we cycle through different sets of lens states. In addition to having no moving parts, this approach allows significantly better form factor compared to its predecessors. Here we compare our new electronic module to the original Half Dome assembly. You can see that there's a considerable reduction in size. So that's what it's taken to advance the state of the art in just one aspect of the visual experience for VR, depth of focus. And depth of focus for AR is an even more challenging problem. Since Meta is about connecting people, let's look at avatars next. As you watch the next video, you'll see Yasser and Danny wearing headsets in the real world video in the corners. The faces in the center are avatars, and they're animated in real time entirely from cameras in the headset. What can your face do? Can you show us? Well, I've always hoped you would ask me that question. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I have some pretty good, I think, mouth movement. Mm. How about your eyes? Can you, can you look left, right, up, down? Mm -hmm. Um, good, good, good. Yeah, I'm gonna be surprised. Ah, ooh. Mm. I like, my, I think one of my favorites is puffing my cheeks. Mm. The mouthwash, mouthwash commercial. Mm hmm And rolling my tongue. Mm. Mm, that's pretty good, actually. Yeah. Good, good, good. It's hard to believe that those are real-time reconstructions rather than videos of real people. And it certainly doesn't take a huge leap to imagine how doing that in VR could be far more satisfying and personal than seeing someone's image on a flat screen. Now, while being able to be with truly realistic avatars of other people would be great, what would really make it compelling would be being able to teleport anywhere in the world with those people. And that means being able to reconstruct real places, like this apartment. Here's a reconstruction of that apartment done with consumer-grade sensors. Every time I see this, I'm astonished at how realistic it looks. This level of reconstruction will enable virtual teleportation and powerful mixed reality. Now let's look at something completely different. A great display lets us experience the virtual world, but it takes hands to let us become dexterous virtual actors. One of our longest term, highest risk research projects is aimed at developing practical haptic gloves. This involves novel models of the hands, a new state of the art in nanofluidics, innovative sensors and actuators, and more. 
What you're seeing here is an early prototype. Finally, a haptic glove could be a complete solution for VR, but AR requires an always available ultra-low friction input mechanism. We believe that we have a great solution with electromyography, or EMG, a novel input approach that can read the signals on the motor neurons that run through the wrist to the hand. EMG is still in the research phase, but the control labs team that joined us two years ago is advancing the state of the art rapidly, as we can see in this video. The signals through the wrist are so clear that EMG can detect finger motion of just a millimeter, ideal for actions like a mouse click. And it has the potential to be not only the mouse, but also the keyboard for AR. There are years of research yet to do, but EMG has the potential to be the core input device for AR glasses. Every one of the technology pillars has similar needs and challenges, and we're working to push them all beyond the state of the art. But there's one more thing that's needed, and that's innovation in the underlying semiconductor technologies. That would be needed even if there was only VR, because it's a challenge to fit all of that new high-end functionality into a compact, comfortable, cool headset. But the challenge is massively amplified for all-day wearable, socially acceptable AR glasses, where the weight, power, thermal, and form factor constraints are far beyond anything needed for today's mobile devices. So let's look at the challenges and opportunities XR creates for semiconductor technology. As you might imagine from the discussion so far, AR glasses, and also VR headsets, although to a slightly lesser degree, are extraordinarily complex systems of systems as a result of the sheer number of heterogeneous components they require, combined with very stringent requirements. All those components have to be squeezed into a comfortable, lightweight design, which also has to be socially acceptable in the case of AR. The components include cameras to pinpoint our physical location and reconstruct and understand our context, cameras to take photos, cameras and illuminators to track the movement of our eyes, and depth sensors to track hands and properly integrate virtual objects with the real world. Displays and optics to overlay sharp, realistic virtual content on our view of the world. CPUs, GPUs, and AI accelerators to perform the compute necessary to capture the real world and render the virtual world. AI is critical for models, for example, the avatars we saw earlier, for input, such as camera images and audio, and for output, including graphics and audio rendering. While cloud processing is an option, a great deal of AR involves real-time interaction for which latency requirements dictate on-device processing. Memories to work in tandem with the compute nodes, Microphone arrays to capture both the user's own voice and the voices of others the user is conversing with. Speakers to provide immersive audio content and fast wireless technology to keep the user connected. All of these technologies have to work together to deliver a responsive, low latency experience. And at the same time, they have to consume very limited power, both to enable all day run times and to limit thermals for user comfort. As a result, performance per watt is even more critical than for mobile devices, and it is a tremendous challenge to deliver the required performance with the necessary level of power consumption and latency. Fully solving this will require a range of radical improvements, and in some cases, paradigm shifts in both hardware, especially semiconductors, and software. For starters, specialization at the level of architecture and domain-oriented accelerators needs to evolve to address the constraints of the XR space. XR workloads are heavily machine learning based, so one key element of this is AI acceleration. But there is also tremendous scope for custom acceleration of specific applications, such as avatar tracking, eye tracking, scene reconstruction, audio, graphics, physics simulation, and EMG. For AI, custom ASIC solutions are needed to increase the speed and power budget for inference, and in the future for training as well, as the performance power area of today's devices is far from what is needed. For specific applications, in addition to custom ASICs, algorithm optimization will be needed in areas such as model compression, low precision compute, and platform aware design optimization. However, while all of these advances are needed, the extraordinarily stringent requirements of XR cannot be achieved solely by isolated improvements in algorithms, circuit architectures, or even semiconductor technologies, simply because the power performance demands are so great. 
In particular, the system will need to be able to capture, process, and analyze massive amounts of irregular sparse data, and the computation demands will in many cases far exceed the capabilities of today's systems. And, as mentioned earlier, these requirements must be met precisely as the traditional power and performance driver, Moore's Law, nears its end. So the fundamental question is, how can we improve the power efficiency of AR systems radically by a factor of 100 or even 1,000? That will require a deep system-level rethinking of the full stack with end-to-end -end co design of hardware and software, and the place to start that rethinking is by looking at where power is going today. Here we see an analysis of the energy consumption of different operations normalized to an 8-bit integer addition. The bars on the left are for compute operations. As we go from 8 bits to 16 bits, from addition to multiplication, and from integer to floating point, energy increases. An 8-bit multiply is 15 times the energy of an 8-bit add. A 16-bit floating point add is 125 times the energy of an 8-bit add, and so on. The bars on the right are all one-byte data transfers from NOC, MIPI, DRAM, and wireless interfaces, respectively. It's obvious that data transfer is more expensive than compute. The y-axis is a log scale. Fetching one byte from DRAM requires 12,000 times more energy than an 8-bit add, while transferring one byte through wireless requires more than 300,000 times more energy than an 8-bit add. And this is with optimistic assumptions for the wireless link. It's also informative to break down the power cost associated with each function. Examples of this are shown on the right side. The analyses of SLAM and hand tracking workloads running on a traditional SOC architecture show that energy is dominated by memory access and data movement. In both cases, more than 50% of the total power goes to SRAM and DRAM. Clearly, for low power applications, it is critical to reduce the amount of data transfer as much as possible. Promising solutions to the data transfer problem include several distributed computing paradigms that are substantially different from traditional von Neumann computing. The idea is that by processing the data locally, close to where the data are generated or stored, rather than in a single centralized compute unit, we can eliminate much of the energy spent on data movement. In order to enable that, novel semiconductor technologies like ultra-dense 3D stacking with micro TSV through silicon vias, hybrid bonding, and monolithic 3D will be essential for achieving the high bandwidth and tight coupling of logic with memories, sensors, displays, and analog that will be required to enable low-power, high-performance distributed computing. In addition, new embedded non-volatile memories will open up revolutionary computing paradigms. For example, spin transfer torque magnetic random access memory, STTRAM, embedded in cutting edge logic nodes, FinFET, will be key for power and area optimization of XRML compute platforms due to its high density and zero leakage. Now let's look at a specific example, the very demanding technology of XR image sensors. Future generations of XR systems will need to incorporate multiple tiny cameras that capture irregular sparse data to enable the full set of computer vision and related AI technologies, including tracking, mapping, scene reconstruction, and other machine perception functions. These sensors will need to have ultra-low power consumption with a very small footprint. Furthermore, to support real-time tracking functions during both daytime and nighttime across the full set of indoor and outdoor use cases, wide dynamic range and excellent low light sensitivity will be required. The combination of requirements for lowest power, best performance, and smallest possible form factor make XR sensors the new frontier in the image sensor industry. After studying all the global shutter sensor architectures, we came to the conclusion that digital pixel sensor, DPS, was the best candidate for meeting the needs of XR machine perception. DPS incorporates an analog to digital converter, an ADC, and digital memory inside each pixel. In DPS, all pixels are exposed and quantized in parallel, so it is inherently a global shutter sensor. The pixel array readout is done in the digital domain, so it can achieve much higher frame rate than traditional analog rolling scan readout. Most importantly, DPS delivers the lowest power consumption. Consequently, we've developed our own DPS sensors for AR glasses, applying many of the concepts discussed earlier. 
For these sensors, we use the most advanced stack CMOS image sensor, CIS, process, where two silicon wafers are stacked together face-to-face -to -face using hybrid bonding. The in-pixel metal-to-metal connections enable us to partition the pixel circuit into two layers of silicon. The top layer is called the CIS layer, and it hosts the pixel front-end sensing circuit. The CIS layer is optimized for light sensing, featuring a microlens, an infrared-enhanced photodiode, and low-noise optimized transfer and source follower transistors. This layer is thinned, with light coming in from the backside to the photodiode. The bottom layer is called the ADC layer, and it hosts the analog to digital converter and the in-pixel digital memory. By separating the layers, we're able to reduce power supply voltage on the ADC layer, which results in very low power consumption for the ADC and memory operations. The ADC layer simultaneously captures light levels in three different ranges for each pixel, and then reports the one that's the best fit, dramatically increasing dynamic range. The DPS sensor has been implemented in a 45 nanometer slash 65 nanometer stack process. The CIS layer is optimized for imaging performance, while the ADC layer is optimized for low power mixed mode circuits. The details of the CIS and ADC circuit designs were presented at the last IEDM conference. We additionally integrated other functional blocks such as analog ramp generation, voltage regulators, PLL, MIPI, and other logic functions. One drawback of DPS is that it requires a large number of transistors per pixel to implement the ADC and digital memory circuit. As such, early versions of DPS resulted in much larger pixel size than traditional analog approaches. By applying the latest stack sensor process with in-pixel interconnection technology and partitioning the pixel functions across the two stack silicon layers, we achieved a very reasonable pixel size of 4.6 micrometers. This is the smallest DPS pixel reported to date. Here are some other key specs for our implementation. The die size is four by four millimeters with 512 by 512 effective pixels. The total power is about five milliwatts at 30 frames per second, less than 25% of the power consumption of a comparable off the shelf sensor. And the maximum frame rate is 480 frames per second. The net result is substantial power reduction accompanied by much greater dynamic range. The image on the left was captured from a high dynamic range seen by a commercial global shutter sensor with nominal dynamic range with a 300 microsecond exposure and 1x gain. The same scene is shown on the right as captured by our DPS sensor, again with a 300 microsecond exposure and 1x gain. With our sensor, you can simultaneously see both the glowing filament and the objects in the dark background below. Our sensor has a dynamic range up to 10 times greater than the equivalent off-the-shelf sensor, again, while using less than one quarter as much power. As substantial and advanced as this is, it's just a first step towards sensors that can fully meet the requirements of AR glasses. A complete solution requires design of the sensors as part of an end-to-end -end optimized system, which will require rethinking the overall system architecture. The key to this rethinking is that in traditional XR systems, the raw images captured by several sensors are transferred via MIPI serial interfaces to a separate aggregation processor for computing. However, the data transfer from the sensors to the aggregator is very energy hungry, and the cameras, the MIPI serial interfaces, and the memories dominate the power consumption of the system. To solve the system level challenges and minimize energy and latency, we propose a new distributed architecture that performs computation at multiple hardware levels, including on-sensor processor, on-device aggregator, and the cloud, as shown here. This is partially motivated by the several orders of magnitude difference in data bandwidth and energy costs between micro-TSV, connecting the camera with the on-sensor processor, MIPI, connecting the on-sensor processors with the aggregator, and finally, the wireless interfaces. In our proposed architecture, only high-level data representations are transferred through the energy-hungry MIPI interface, so the distributed system allows for minimum data movement and localized inference on the sensors, which translates not only to minimal power dissipation and latency, but also to enhance privacy and security. We're currently exploring the energy-optimal partitioning of the image processing pipeline over the proposed distributed architecture. 
specialization at the level of compute microarchitecture and domain-oriented accelerators, especially with respect to computer vision and AI functions, is essential. And co-optimization of hardware and software algorithms is needed to achieve the necessary power reduction. For example, a shallow portion of the deep neural networks, segmentation and classification for XR workloads such as eye tracking and hand tracking, can be implemented on sensor. However, in order to fabricate such a smart sensor, we need to exploit a completely new process based on triple wafer stacking technology, where an additional logic wafer is integrated into the two-layer stack DPS sensor via face-to-back hybrid bonding and dense micro TSV in the second layer, as shown here on the left. FinFET and magnetic RAM will be necessary on the AI compute layer to allow for a very small form factor, ultra-low power, and true on-sensor ML computing. However, availability of these embedded memories in the most advanced logic technology nodes will be necessary in order to realize these benefits. Thus, the development of MRAM technologies by foundries is a critical element for developing AR glasses. Combined together in an end-to-end -end system, our proposed distributed architecture and the associated technology I've described have the potential for enormous improvements in power, area, and form factor. Improvements that are necessary for AR glasses to become comfortable and functional enough to be a part of daily life for a billion people. Optics and displays is another XR technology area that's in need of innovative semiconductor solutions. In particular, all day wearable, compact form factor, socially acceptable consumer grade AR glasses require a step change beyond today's commercially available technologies along multiple display technology axes, including brightness, contrast, resolution, color depth, color gamut, efficiency, aberrations and artifacts, field of view, see-through quality, size, and weight. There are many display engines available today, including 2D reflective, laser scanning, and emissive displays, but none fully meets the requirements of AR glasses. The challenges in meeting those requirements are considerable, but this also opens up new opportunities for semiconductor devices, both conventional silicon and compound semiconductor based. One such opportunity is in the area of ultra small pixel pitch micro LEDs, which can deliver the necessary form factor brightness and resolution today, but need significant improvement in size dependent efficiency losses through proper pixel sidewall passivation and improved light extraction from high refractive index semiconductors. System level performance would improve significantly with better control over emission spectra, directionality, and polarization. This slide shows an example of a simulated far field profile resulting from directional emission. This type of control improves system efficiency and provides levers to the system architect. Another area with considerable potential is novel backplanes with ultra high resolution, hybridization, and added functionality for pixel defect compensation. Yet another area involves metamaterials where high resolution lithography and advanced processing techniques from the semiconductor industry could be used to integrate metamaterial features with emissive light sources to add new functionality and improve system efficiency. Finally, a novel end-to-end -end graphics pipeline architected around AR use cases and ultra low power needs to be developed in order to reduce power consumption sufficiently to allow all day display of 3D virtual objects. The development of novel high resolution, high efficiency, compact emissive display systems is key to unlocking the potential of AR glasses. I've only talked about two technology areas, sensors and displays, but similar advances in semiconductor technology need to happen in virtually every area of XR, especially for AR glasses. These advances need to happen along three major axes. Along the first axis, Moore's law needs to be pushed to the limit. The leading foundries must continue to miniaturize the key components, including leading edge CMOS, but also specialty technologies such as e-memories, camera image sensors, and displays via the most advanced process technologies. The exceedingly demanding requirements of XR platforms mean that integration of new materials will likely be required given the potential for beyond CMOS technologies, including spintronics, 2D materials, CNT, functional interconnects, flexible materials, and metamaterials to enable substantial scaling of system performance at unit power density and unit volume. 
The second axis is very large scale 3D heterogeneous integration of circuits and systems to create new functions. This includes advanced packaging and interposer, wafer on wafer and chip on wafer technologies, 3D micro TSV, and monolithic 3D. Note that new chip level 3D electronic design automation tools will be needed, including at the architectural level. The third axis covers all the technologies that go under the umbrella of hardware software co-design, including specialization at the level of architecture and domain-oriented accelerators, design slash technology co-optimization, system slash technology co-optimization, and the new distributed computing paradigm described earlier, including on-sensor compute and memory-centric compute. Only by driving innovation along all three axes simultaneously will it be possible to meet the extraordinarily demanding requirements of XR. The bottom line is that virtually every aspect of XR requires systemic innovation and rethinking, all the way from foundational semiconductor technologies to algorithms and applications, with end-to-end -end co design of hardware and software from a user-centric application point of view. So, it will take all of the technology pillars I've mentioned, tightly integrated with innovative, highly customized silicon, co-designed as part of an end-to-end -end stack to enable future generations of XR, especially for AR glasses. The semiconductor innovations discussed earlier aren't just optimizations. They are fundamental requirements for achieving the world-changing potential of XR and for making Mark's vision of the metaverse a reality. And that vision, the second great wave of human-oriented computing, is very much worth making happen. It will enable remote work that's more productive than in person, allowing people to live where they want, smaller communities to thrive, and a level playing field where opportunity isn't limited by location. It will allow us to stay in the world rather than constantly looking at our devices, enabling us to connect better with other people both in person and when remote. It will save vast amounts of energy and free up our time as travel is needed far less often. It will annotate and enrich our world and it will give us truly personalized assistance and augmentation for our perceptions and our memory. In short, it has the potential to change the world every bit as much as personal computing has, and maybe more. And with that come enormous new long-term opportunities for the semiconductor industry. I'm going to close with a bit of personal history. Back in December of 2011, I met with Otman Binstock, now Meta's chief VR architect, in a coffee shop in Kirkland to try to convince him to come work on AR and VR with me. Understandably, he was pretty skeptical. He asked, why now? And I pointed out how half a dozen technologies were coming together that would collectively make VR and AR feasible. And I'll point out that in retrospect, that was entirely accurate. Then he asked, why me? As Ottman put it in his blog post when he joined Oculus, after all, if the technology was really ready, surely people more capable than me would figure it out. But Michael convinced me that this was basically the myth of technological inevitability. The idea that because technologies were possible, they would just naturally happen. Instead, the way technological revolutions actually happen involves smart people working hard on the right problems at the right time. And if I wanted a revolution and I thought I was capable of contributing, I should be actively pushing it forward. And make no mistake, it is every bit as much a revolution as the one that Xerox PARC sparked half a century ago. At Meta, we're driving as hard as we can to make it happen. But this is not something that one company can or should do alone. I hope you will decide that these are the right problems at the right time and join us in creating the future. Thank you. So great, inspiring talk. I think that uh, we are supposed to have a um, connection with Michael, so. Um, I am here. You're here, okay. Hi, Michael, good morning. I don't know if you can see me, but I'm here. We can see you. You, unfortunately, you cannot see us, but so trust that we are here, so. Great. <laughs> So I think that uh, thank you very much for this uh, very inspiring and explanatory uh, talk. Um, now we are, um, I think Michael is, uh, um, let's say, willing to take some question if there are some. Uh, 
question? Please. And uh, hopefully you hear the question, so let us know. Please. Okay. Yeah, I'm Daniel Worledge from IBM Research. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk, very exciting. You mentioned spin transfer torque MRAM several times. Can you explain what kind of um, uh, requirements you would have on the memory? What kind of density or endurance or write or read cycle times are needed to uh, make this work? It's a great question, but it's one I'm going to defer to Barbara, who is truly the expert in that area. Barbara, <laughs> do you want to answer that? Yeah, so I, I think I will, uh, I will be happy to discuss with you later. So for sure, it's uh, <laughs> STT MRAM is uh, one of the, um, let's say, uh, emerging memories uh, which is, have a big potential for these uh, kind of applications. It was an example, so we can discuss later. All right, thanks. I think there's a, so there's a, um, hopefully other question, please. Um, um, otherwise, I can uh, also um, ask you some questions. So in the previous talk, Dr. Kinam Kim uh, was um, asking for um, a, a, a wide collaboration of the ecosystem um, um, to address, uh, let's say, the future problem of uh, semiconductor we also face uh, this year in this year that uh, particularly for COVID uh, we face uh, this um, uh, difficulty in accessing semiconductor. So my question for you is, uh, what do you um, want to tell to the semiconductor um, um, community in terms of collaboration to achieve uh, um, maybe the, in the next, uh, the second wave of computing as you were uh, introducing? Uh, as I said, this is, this is so difficult that it has to be solved with truly end-to-end -end solutions. And I mean, the sensor example is just beautiful where it's really saying we are going from photons to an inference out the other end, right? We're not building a sensor and then saying, what can you do with the sensor? We're saying this is actually what needs to come out of the other end. So how do we fit all the pieces together? So in terms of the ecosystem, I do feel like this is something that does have to be an industry-wide effort. Um, it's certainly not something that, you know, we're, we have any idea that we would do by ourselves. And at the same time, I think the opportunity for the semiconductor industry in working closely with people like us to get that full pipeline in place um, has, is both necessary and it opens up large new opportunity. Uh, so Thank it you. seems to me that the possibilities from built together are literally the difference between making this work as well as it needs to and being stuck at some kind of local maximum. And, uh, you know, I've learned a great deal about this from you, Barbara, um, and also from Chao Lu, who uh, has led the sensor effort. And it has just become clear to me that this is the only way that we will ever get to AR that is as ubiquitous as phones are today. So. I think it is an ecosystem effort, and I um, look forward very much to partnering with the industry. Thank you, Michael. There is a question, please. Yes. Thank you. Michael, that was an excellent talk. This is Shuman Dara from Notre Dame. Uh, you know, uh, we're coming out of the COVID, the pandemic, but uh, it has disproportionately affected uh, people with, from lower income uh, countries, et cetera. So when you, this vision of Mark Zuckerberg about metaverse, this is about connecting people, giving access to people, looks like these technologies are exciting. As a technologist, I'm excited to work on some of the underlying semiconductor stuff. But how is this, but they look like very expensive technologies. Is this something that metaverse will be accessible only by rich countries or ultimately other people around the world would also be able to be participating in metaverse? What's your thoughts on that? Well, I have a few different thoughts about that, but one thing I'll point out is that cell phones started off as being extremely expensive and ultimately became the single greatest um, creator of opportunity for people in the developing world. And uh, there is a well-known curve for technology where it starts off expensive and that basically subsidizes the development of it in a positive spiral to where it be becomes a com commodity. I mean, as one small example, my first IBM PC in today's dollars cost 
dollars. And you know, now I could go out and buy a computer for a few hundred dollars. So part of it is to say, well, it's a process and that process, the, the more successful it becomes, the more broadly it gets used, the more broadly it gets used. <clears throat> um, the, another thing is that there is really an element to this in my mind that the glasses are almost an anything machine where by wearing the glasses, you now have access to so much in the way of both information and tools that currently really require location that um, a lot of people can't have access to or tools they can't. And so just as one small thing, if you could work as effectively using AR glasses or VR headset as you could work in person, all of a sudden where people happen to have been born, where they happen to live, is not going to uh, their opportunity. So I do think that over time, this really does become very much a leveling thing. It's not people who can manage to move, for example, to the San Francisco Bay Area, who can uh, have the opportunity to have, you know, really interesting, good jobs. So it's a process. And uh, I do think that these will be expensive to begin with, although I'll point out that, you know, Quest 2 is, is not expensive at all by consumer electronics standards. But I think this will create more opportunity than really anything since the personal computing revolution. And uh, it, it, it'll just take some time to figure out how to make it all work, to integrate it into how people work and how they live. Thank you. I have so, a question. Yeah, Can I? Last question, please. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. Uh, I have a question to Michael, a little bit uh, different maybe. Um, I think we can figure out uh, how to make semiconductors working for you um, with time, uh, with the scale we can have. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, I'm sorry. My name is Tomek Brozek. I'm with PDF Solutions. Um, I would like to ask a question about the uh, uh, XR or VR generally. Um, you gave an e great examples how reality can, uh, you know, trick us. How about XR tricking us? Um, what kind of, you know, system um, protection we would have to put in place that uh, uh, people wouldn't be tricked by, by uh, X reality uh, and we would well, know that this is real. I think part of the question comes down to, you know, what sort of trick you're talking about. I think the one that to me seems most important is to make sure that when you're talking to someone, you're talking to that you think you're talking to because an avatar, you know, to know that the avatar is a real representation of that person. And fundamentally, I don't think that these problems are different from the ones that we face before VR exists and before XR exists. Now, so that 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 is one issue and that's certainly something that we are looking at uh, very carefully, how to make sure that you can have that trust in what you're looking at. Now, when you talk about XR, if the question is, how do you know that what you see that's mapped in from the real world is real? Um, I don't think that that's a big problem for quite a while. So in VR, you're going to be operating in, in a limited space, in a room, for example, you're not moving around. I don't think that there's a big opportunity there for confusion about you know, what you're seeing from the real world. In AR, I, I wish almost that there was the problem of, well, how are you going to a long time before you generate virtual images in AR glasses that are indistinguishable in the world? particularly because AR glasses are additive rather, so you can't draw black with them, you can only add more color. So I don't see the problem of mixed reality being misleading as being an issue for, for a very long time, to be honest with you. All right, thank you. So let's thank Michael. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you for having me here, Barbara. <laughs>